Hi, everyone. Happy Pride. I guess it isn't actually that happy because of the whole situation. You know, I was skeptical at first, but now I think the commercials were right. It is hard to have a gay time on your own. <laughs> God, that's terrible. Anyway, I figured that I could use this time to do something a little uplifting and funny, like discuss how the satirical news publication The Onion satirizes homophobia. Just off the top of my head, you know? Now, Goodreads tells me it was E.B. White and slash or Mark Twain who said, quote, explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog. You understand it better, but the frog dies in the process, end quote, which is a statement I generally agree with. However, that won't stop me because I feel that these are worth analyzing. So today we're going to be dissecting some frogs, some very gay frogs. <laughs> because of this, I have left links to all of the articles and videos by The Onion I am going to be discussing today, and I highly recommend you give them a look and experience them in their natural habitat before I start cutting them open with a scalpel and pulling out their intestines. Also, a fair warning before we start, while I have censored slurs used in these clips, there are obviously going to be some very homophobic attitudes, statements, and ideas present in them, as well as various other shades of bigotry. So if those kinds of things are triggering to you, I'd recommend you not watch this video. Anyway, let's get right to analyzing. The first piece of media we'll be discussing is The Onion's Future News from the year 2137, the premise of which involves The Onion News Network, being America's finest news source, using its state-of-the-art wormhole satellite to bring its viewers exclusive news transmissions from the year 2137, in which the world has been reduced to a dystopian wasteland. The video has some very clever jokes, such as the running joke where the news anchors will nonchalantly drop the F-word and the phrase I love you because they've been overused to the point that they've lost all weight, or the report about President Performance H. Wilson's approval ratings dropping because he hasn't yet delivered on his promise of killing everybody and ending their miserable lives that got him elected to his sixth term in office. And for 2012, it boasts some very impressive, though incredibly disorienting, special effects. The part I want to talk about today is the story titled Grimland's Shutdown Over Gays Marrying, which reports on the protesters gathered in the Free Speech Square, located in the capital of the Indiana Grimlands, to protest the possible legalization of gay marriage in what remains of their state. The segment features several interviews with protesters, and in one of these interviews, a man, who the GUI helpfully tells us is suffering from no-leg syndrome, argues that If we allow gays to marry, God will punish us even worse than he already has. We have to oppose this legislation not just for our own sake, but for the sake of America's packs of feral children. This man is making two arguments that should be painfully familiar to anyone aware of the debate surrounding gay marriage. The appeal to religion, gay marriage is against God's will and he will punish us for it, and the think of the children argument, gay marriage is confusing and damaging to children. However, the setting of a lawless dystopian future has rendered these arguments totally irrelevant. God has already punished humanity so severely that there really isn't any room for more punishments, and all of the children are already feral, so them being scarred by gay marriage isn't really much of an issue. This man's clinging to these same arguments even after they've been rendered totally irrelevant highlights the irrelevance of these arguments in the first place. Regardless of your beliefs about God, I think it's uncontroversial to say that the fear of being punished by him should play no part in governmental decisions concerning civil rights, especially when many believers say that the same God supports gay marriage. As for the argument that gay marriage will damage children, according to a Huffington Post article by Murray Lipp, quote, there is no evidence that children are psychologically harmed by having two dads or two moms, end quote let alone that children would be scarred by the mere idea of gay marriage. The pattern of common arguments against gay marriage being rendered irrelevant by the dystopian future continues when this man says, If I get spawned a child that's not stillborn, I don't want him growing up in a world where two men can marry. This remark seems, to me at least, to be a reference to the argument that marriage is for the purpose of having children, often made by opponents of gay marriage. However, the dystopian future has left most people infertile, except for, I'm assuming, the residents of this country that has been labeled Fertile Woman Zone. But the institution of marriage has carried on, rendering the procreation argument irrelevant, and exposing its flaws as well as the plain bigotry behind it. Yet again, the pattern of irrelevant arguments still being used continues when this protester asks, If the Grimm legislature fertilizes this law, what would be next? Men married to donkeys will be allowed to take a second donkey as a wife? This woman's question mimics the slippery slope argument used by opponents of gay marriage, later satirized by The Onion again in an article titled, Gay Marriage Opponents Warm Supreme Court Ruling Could Put Nation on Slippery Slope to Rationality, which I don't really think I have to explain. Anyway, this argument poses that legalizing gay marriage will be a slippery slope, leading to the legalization of other types of marriages involving animals or multiple people. 
However, once again, older arguments against gay marriage have been made irrelevant by the apocalypse. The crumbling downfall of society predicted by the slippery slope argument has happened without the legalization of gay marriage, and the institution of marriage has shifted, as it does, to include marriages to animals, a shift highlighted in this graphic instructing viewers to get certified as a non-gay by marrying the animal of their choice so that they may see the sunlight again, and with this shift in the institution, the goalposts of the argument have been shifted as well. Once again, this scene demonstrates the problems with and irrelevancy of the slippery slope argument, as the very changes it predicted would happen to society if gay marriage were legalized happened without the legalization of gay marriage, because they had nothing to do with gay marriage in the first place. What's more, the whole piece serves as a rebuttal to the state's rights argument, which asserts that the decision whether or not to legalize gay marriage should be left up to the states. One prominent example of this is Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, who, after the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, said that the justices, quote, have imposed on the entire country their personal views on an issue that the Constitution and the court's previous decisions reserved to the people of the states, end quote. This argument was also made by racists who opposed desegregation, but I'm sure that's just a coincidence. However, the problems with this argument are clear from the beginning, as it's very obvious many states would never do so in a million years, which is why civil rights decisions like the legalization of gay marriage should not be left up to the states, and this future news network story perfectly demonstrates this. We've traveled 124 years into the future, and still only five U.S. states have legalized gay marriage. Massachusetts, Vermont, Procter & Gamble, Carolina, and Gay Texas. What's more, the entire segment demonstrates an idea that Dr. King wrote about in his letter from a Birmingham jail, as a response to the idea that civil rights activists should just wait, because people of color would receive rights eventually. That is, the idea that time itself is neutral, and can be used to achieve the goals of social progression, social stagnation, or, in the case of the future news network we're discussing, social regression. For hundreds of years, gay people have been deprived not just of the right to marry, but also of the rights to visit their partners on government smallpox hospice boats, dig graves for their partners when they die, live child adoption, mercy killing rights, whatever that means, and even the right to live above ground. People care so much about the continuation of this oppression that they're willing to travel 60 miles by sewage canal barge to protest about it and value stopping gay marriage over detoxifying food supplies or confining wolf mutants to the wastelands. But just as homophobes persevere in their fight to oppress gay people, so too do gay people persevere in their fight to do away with that oppression. One such person is Citizen X436A, a gay resident of the Grimlands who was also interviewed. If we secure the right to marry, maybe one day we'll derive the right to live above ground. We deserve the same rights as all the other subhuman groups. Are we not as good as the lizard people of Arizona? Now, jokes about lizard people or not being able to live above ground, and the fact that saying gay people deserve the same rights as any of the other subhuman groups positions gay people as subhuman aside, Citizen X436A makes a serious and compelling argument for gay marriage. Gay marriage was, and still is, a civil rights issue, and an important one at that. Luckily, there are a few politicians who agree with Citizen X436A, such as Harlan Downey, who the reporter tells us bought his Senate seat two years ago. This landmark bill is the next step in the war for gay equality that began 168 years ago! You know, I never thought I'd be saying this, but, uh, the corrupt politician in the cage is right. The second piece of media we'll be discussing today is a 2010 segment of Today Now, The Onion's parody series of breakfast television shows like BBC Breakfast or Good Morning America, titled New Anti-Smoking Ads Warn Teens It's Gay to Smoke. Now, Today Now has lampooned teens and preteens before in videos like Missing Teens Friends Go on TV to Plead for Her Release, Gossip About Ugly Classmates, and Boy Loses Leg in Totally Awesome Shark Attack. And this video falls into that same trend by tackling the topic of homophobia among teenagers, with a specific focus on teen boys. A 2015 survey by the mental health charity Beyond Blue that asked 304 Australian young men from the ages of 14 to 17 about their attitudes towards LGBTQ plus people found that 21% agreed it was hard to treat LGBTQ plus people the same way as everyone else, 38% were unsure or disagreed that they would be happy to include LGBTQ plus people in their friendship group, and 40% said that being around LGBTQ plus people made them uncomfortable. I understand that statistics alone don't convey the problem very well, especially because they're only in Australia and cover a relatively small sample size, and I'm also guessing the super boring way in which I listed them all out probably made your eyes all glaze over as well. So I also have a few examples. A few examples of this in action are the widespread uses of phrases like no homo, gay, when it's used in the context of being an insult, which if you remember 2010 was pretty common, 
and the F slur by teenagers, because these phrases paint being gay as something bad to be ashamed of. I also feel it's worth mentioning that the people who unironically use these terms, and some who don't, often mix a lot of transphobia in as well. But I'm not going to list off a few examples like I did for homophobia, because most of them are just slurs, which... <sighs> Of course, any explanation of why this behavior happens, even if it is well-founded, is ultimately going to end up overly simplified speculation, but I think it's safe to say that a large part is that teenagers often strive to fit in and not appear different. This aversion to seeming different, when combined with societal pressures, manifests in two ways. The first of these is to obsess over fitting into the societal constructs of the gender they were assigned at birth, and the construct they'll obsess over fitting into is most often going to be incredibly heteronormative. This is why many teenage boys are very obsessed over their sense of masculinity, and why they view insults like gay as an attack to that masculinity. The other manifestation of this is distancing themselves from people who are different and don't fit in, which in our case means queer people, and slash or bullying them so as to not become associated with that otherness. Obviously, this isn't meant to excuse any of this behavior. It's very ridiculous and incredibly harmful. This Today Now segment functions as a satire of this homophobia, with this premise being that the CDC, in an attempt to scare teens into not smoking by speaking their language, ends up producing an incredibly homophobic ad campaign that conflates the sense of otherness attached to queer people with the practice of smoking and preying off of teenagers' desire to fit in to scare them. Are they smoking? Or are they gay? It's gay to smoke. The segment recognizes the ridiculousness of this behavior with moments such as the lower third reading, Studies Find Teens Fear Being Called Homo More Than Cancer, Emphysema. At the end of the segment, director of PSA's Dr. Michael Gaines reveals that although the main focus of the segment is the materials produced to persuade teenage boys, the CDC has also been producing similar materials targeting teenage girls. This revelation highlights that while most of the conversation about teen homophobia focuses on boys, probably because they're much more likely to hold harmful views towards LGBTQ plus people, these same attitudes and behaviors exist among teenage girls as well. Another thing I think the segment is sort of indirectly addressing is the long-standing question of whether art imitates life or life imitates art, and its answer seems to be both. The homophobic contents of the ad campaign are definitely the result of the views of its target demographic as well as larger societal pressures, and arguably the views of Dr. Gaines himself. On the other hand, these PSAs obviously influence these 8th graders' behavior and opinions concerning cigarettes, and I don't really think it's a stretch to say that it fed into the larger societal pressures that influenced it and encouraged more of the behaviors in its target demographic that inspired it in the first place. However, I do have one problem with this segment, and it's that, unlike the Future News Network story, we don't hear from any gay people about how this affected them. I get that this is a comedy segment and that the tone of that sort of thing would be difficult to manage, but I think it would help to clearly establish the purpose to even further prevent it from being mistaken for the thing it's satirizing, and point out that the behavior isn't just ridiculous, it's also incredibly harmful. Using gay as an insult isn't bad solely because it makes you sound like a cringy 13-year-old who just discovered Call of Duty. It does. It's bad because it harms and invalidates LGBTQ plus people. The last video I'll be discussing today is another segment of Today Now titled Finding Masculine Halloween Costumes for Your Effeminate Son, in which parenting expert Anna Stevenson drops by the show to show parents of girly sons costume tips to survive Halloween without accentuating their child's already obvious homosexuality in order to prevent bullying, and in my opinion, serves as a witty satire of the imposition of the rigid construct of masculinity on young boys. From a young age, boys are expected to abandon behaviors of theirs deemed more feminine, like flamboyancy and emotional vulnerability, and to fit into a narrow and rigid box of masculinity that is often very heteronormative. The Today Now segment perfectly satirizes this. Boys are forced into bulky robot costumes to change the way they walk, and their voices are covered by robot sound effects and cumbersome bear masks because those aspects of them are deemed too feminine. I can't think of any better visualization of the emotionally damaging masculinization of boys and people of other genders assigned male at birth than a parenting expert pouring copious amounts of fake blood over an unwilling child while the host of a popular breakfast television program stands by and coos about how very masculine it makes him look. The segment also comments on how this construct of masculinity sets a double standard for queer people. 
Boys are expected to dress masculine, but not masculine in the way that has been co-opted by gay men. But if you want your child to depict a male-dominated profession, mm -hmm. be very careful not to choose one that's been co-opted by the gay community, like oh. a fireman, a cop, a cowboy. Good point. Otherwise, right. they'll just end up looking like a stripper. Right, exactly. And are allowed to be flashy and flamboyant, so long as it's a heterosexual brand of flamboyancy. Yes, well, vampires are flashy dressers, uh -huh. but it's all in the service of seducing a woman. Flamboyancy. For the straights. What's more, the pretense that this is for the purpose of protecting them from ridicule is laughable when the homophobia behind its pretenses is unveiled at the very end. Now, I hope you parents at home who have f acting little boys have been taking notes because we've gotten a lot of good advice here. As psychologist Terry Real points out about this process of severing boys from the stereotypically feminine aspects of themselves, quote, every step is injurious. It's traumatic. It's traumatic to be forced to abdicate half of your own humanity, end quote. These boys would be so much better off if they learned to accept themselves for who they are, and forcing them to be something they aren't is psychologically damaging, homophobic, and ultimately ineffective. I'm a big old man. The final piece of media I'll be examining today is an article from 2018 titled Man Prefers Comic Books That Don't Insert Politics Into Stories About Government Engineered Agents of War, which I'm going to read in its entirety because it's one of those Onion articles that's short but sweet much like my periods of self-confidence, but those are a lot less common. Local man Jeremy Land reportedly voiced his preference Thursday for more comic books that don't insert politics into stories about people forced to undergo body and mind-altering experiments that transform them into government agents of war. I'm tired of simply trying to enjoy escapist stories in which people are tortured and experimented upon at black sites run by authoritarian governments only to have the creators cram political messages down my throat said Land, 31, who added that Marvel's recent additions of female, LGBTQ, and racially diverse characters to long-running story arcs about tyrannical regimes turning social outsiders into powerful killing machines felt like PC propaganda run amok. Look, I get the politics is some people's thing, but I just want to read good stories about people whose position outside society makes them easy prey for tests run by immoral government scientists without a heavy-handed allegory for the Tuskegee study thrown in. Why can't comics be like they used to and just present worlds where superheroes and villains, who are clearly avatars for the values of capitalism, communism, or fascism, battle each other in narratives that explicitly mirror the complex geopolitical dynamics of the Cold War? At press time, Land was posting on a subreddit that he wished comics didn't force him to identify with gay or black superheroes, when all he wanted was stories about oppressive governments rounding up mutants whose only crime was to be born different. Now, this article is obviously satirizing the very specific and very vocal subset of comics fans that complain about forced diversity and political correctness by pointing out the gaping flaw with that argument. Not only is all art inherently political, comics have a rich history of political commentary and allegory. Even if they're just arguing that only progressive politics should be kept out of comics, which is rich considering these are often the same people that glorify the idea of free speech, they still don't have a leg to stand on. As the article points out, superhero comics, which is what I mean when I say comics in this segment, so don't get on me about that, have a long history of stories involving progressive politics and world events, whether it's Watergate or the Tuskegee syphilis studies. The X-Men are a blatant allegory for the civil rights movement. Like, it's not even remotely subtle. NerdSync also has a really good video about how the superhero genre of comics, with characters like Superman, Wonder Woman, and Captain America, was founded on progressive politics. Comics have always been political, and when people say that they want to go back to a time when comics didn't have politics, they're not just talking out of their asses, as this article points out. They're also saying they want to return to a time when they were too naive to understand politics. While I understand why The Onion focused solely on the ridiculous and obvious contradiction present in this argument, especially for how short the article is, I can't in good conscience bring this up without talking about the harm this mindset can cause. One obvious example of this harm is Comicsgate. If you want a more in-depth explanation of what this was, I'd recommend checking out Jose's video on it. But basically, Comicsgate was a lot like Gamergate, a topic that is very relevant in the year of our Lord 2020, in that it was a movement by a bunch of angry white men on the internet to keep progressive politics out of comics through a harassment campaign against comic creators and people in the industry that were women, LGBTQ+, people of color, and various other minority groups. While the effects of online harassment on the specific creators involved should be clear, these actions, and the mindset that goes along with them, have negative effects on many fans witnessing them that belong to the same minority groups. Imagine being a comics fan. It's pretty painful, I know.
I'm sorry. Imagine being a comics fan and hearing a very vocal part of the community denouncing a character that shares an identity with you, whether that character is a woman, a person of color, LGBTQ+, disabled, etc. Because their mere existence is political, and being political is inherently bad. Imagine then seeing those same people verbally harassing creators that also share that identity with you, because they're forcing their agenda into the comics. Odds are, you wouldn't feel welcome as a part of the community, and either keep quiet about being a comics fan, or just leave the community altogether. This scenario most definitely happened to a lot of people, and it's another way in which the argument being satirized by The Onion hurts people. But the argument that comics shouldn't be political doesn't just hurt people, it also hurts comics. These people claim to want comics to be taken seriously as an art form, and to have their hobby taken seriously by society. But if that's what they really want, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Saying you want comics without politics is saying you want comics that don't fundamentally challenge your beliefs and views of the world. It's saying that you want comics that aren't able to provide profound commentary on current events or represent the world in an accurate way, because the world is political. When you're fighting to remove politics from comics, you're not fighting for comics to be taken seriously as an art form. You're fighting for comics to once again be regarded as trashy low art for children with no real value. What is and isn't political is, in and of itself, a political decision. Deciding that comic stories that critique war and capitalism aren't political, but ones that acknowledge the mere existence of characters that are women, people of color, LGBTQ+, or other minority groups are political, harassing their creators for shoving their agenda down your throats, and making people belonging to those minority groups so uncomfortable that they're afraid to voice their opinion isn't just homophobic, it's so many flavors of bigoted that at that point you're basically just running a Baskin Robbins of being an asshole. A wise person once said that the reason satire appeals to us is that, through its exaggeration and caricature, it reveals a deeper truth about the subject of its mockery, or something to that effect. The reason that I said a wise person and not someone's name is because I looked it up and I couldn't find the quote or anything about it, so for all I know I could have come up with it. Probably not though, because I'm not that smart. The Onion, through its satirization of homophobia, makes clear the fallacies and irrelevancy of arguments made by homophobes how simultaneously ridiculous and harmful homophobia is, and how it often overlaps with other societal issues and forms of bigotry. Hi there! Thanks for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a thing or two. If you did, consider liking, commenting, and slash or subscribing. One thing I feel I should mention is that while I did come up with this concept well before the video I'm about to mention was released, I did borrow a couple of the arguments from Quentin Review's video about political messages in kids' shows and cartoons for the last segment of my video. Unlike the other two videos I plugged, I couldn't think of a specific spot in the script to mention this one, but I felt it would be wrong to give the impression I came up with all the arguments on my own, so I'm crediting it now in the credits. Anyway, have a nice day. Goodbye. A wise person once said, shit, a wise person once said, hydrate before you start the take, you fucking nitwit.